P's, and I hope he lives up uh, to, uh, to that promise. And with that, I yield back. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Moskowitz. And I would now, committee staff asked me to go ahead and I will do it, uh, to enter into the congressional record this 12-page document that Michael Schellenberger brought today that describes the Immaculate Constellation government program. Um, so we will do that now. Uh, every member up here has a copy of it. Uh, the first section uh, talks about the unacknowledged special access program called Immaculate Constellation. And the second section about uh, USG imagery intelligence. And uh, Representative Luna just told me if I say Immaculate Constellation, I'll be on some list. Uh, maybe a FISA warrant. So uh, come at me, bro, I guess. But uh, without objection, entered in the record. Uh, all right, so next we will introduce our witnesses for today's hearing. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Our first witness is Rear, retired Rear Admiral Tim Gallaudet, who retired from the U.S. Navy and is now the Chief Executive Officer at Ocean STL Consulting. Our second witness is Mr. Lou Elizondo, a former Department of Defense official and author of a recent bestseller book about UAPs. Our third witness is Mr. Michael Schellenberger, founder of the newsletter Public and author of a recent journalistic piece about special access programs, including one widely identified as Immaculate Constellation. I swear the staff wants me on a list. Um, okay. And our last witness today is Mr. Michael Gold, a former NASA official who was also a member of the NASA UAP Independent Study Team. Welcome, everyone. We are pleased to have you today. Pursuant to Committee Rule 9G, the witnesses will please stand and raise your right hands. This is where it gets real. Do you solemnly swear to affirm that the testimony that you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Let the record show that the witnesses all answered in the affirmative. We appreciate all of you being here today and look forward to your testimony. Let me remind the witnesses that we have read your written statements and they will appear in full in the hearing record. You guys may be seated. Please limit your oral statements to five minutes. As a reminder, please press the button in front of you so the microphone is turned on so that uh, everyone in the room, members included, can hear you. When you begin to speak, the light in front of you will turn green. After four minutes, the light will turn yellow. When the red light comes on, your five minutes has expired, and we would ask that you please wrap it up. So I will first recognize Rear Admiral Gallaudet to please begin your opening remarks. Thank you, Chairwoman Mace, Chairman Grothman, Ranking Members Connolly and Garcia, and members of the committee. Thank you for this opportunity to testify today regarding Unidentified Anomalous Phenomena, or UAP. Confirmation that UAPs are real came to me in January of 2015 when I was serving as the commander of the Navy Meteorology and Oceanography Command. Uh, at the time, my personnel were participating in a pre-deployment naval exercise off the U.S. East Coast. It included the USS Theodore Roosevelt Carrier Strike Group, and this exercise was overseen by the United States Fleet Forces Command led by a four-star admiral who at the time was also my superior officer. During this exercise, I received an email on Navy's secure network from the operations officer of U.S. Fleet Forces Command. The email was addressed to all the subordinate commanders, and the subject line read in all capital letters, urgent safety of flight issue. The text of the email was brief but alarming, with words to the effect, if any of you know what these are, tell me ASAP. We are having multiple near mid-air collisions. And if we do not resolve this soon, we are going to have to shut down the exercise. Attached to the email is what is now known as the Go Fast video, captured on the forward-looking infrared sensor of one of the Navy F-A-18 aircraft participating in the exercise. The now declassified video showed an unidentified object exhibiting flight and structural characteristics unlike anything in our arsenal. The implication of the email was clear. The author was asking whether any of the recipients were aware of classified technology demonstration, demonstrations that could explain these objects. Because the DOD policy is to rigorously, rigorously deconflict such demonstrations with live exercises, I was confident this was not the case. The very next day, that email disappeared from my account and those of the other recipients without explanation. Moreover, the commander of Fleet Forces Command and the operations officer never discussed the subject. Even during weekly meetings specifically designed to address issues affecting exercises like the one in which the Theodore Roosevelt Strike Group was participating. This lack of follow-up was very concerning to me. As the Navy's chief meteorologist at the time, I was responsible for re reducing safety of flight risks. 
Yet it appeared to me that no one at the flag officer level was addressing the safety risk posed by UAPs. Instead, pilots were left to mitigate these threats on their own without guidance or support. I concluded that the UAP information must have been classified within a special access program managed by an intelligence agency. That is a compartmented program that even senior officials, including myself, were not read into. Last year's UAP hearing before this oversight committee confirmed that UAP-related information is being withheld from senior officials and members of Congress. And just this week, I learned from former DOD official Chris Mellon that satellite imagery of UAP from a few years ago still has not been shared with Congress. Equally concerning, last year's UAP hearing also revealed that elements of the government are engaged in a disinformation campaign to include personal attacks designed to discredit UAP whistleblowers. Having never signed a nondisclosure agreement regarding UAPs and now as a private citizen, I've become an advocate for greater UAP transparency from the government. The, co the, the continued overclassification surrounding UAPs has not only hindered our ability to effectively address these phenomena, but has also eroded trust in our institutions. While I applaud previous bipartisan legislation passed by Congress concerning UAPs, a more comprehensive approach is needed to address the broader implication of UAP on public safety and national security, as well as the socioeconomic opportunities that open UAP research could unlock. Therefore, I recommend Congress take the following action, which I believe will receive bipartisan support. First, establish robust oversight of the executive branch's management of UAP information by directing key officials, beginning with the director of the DOD's All-Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, to provide comprehensive briefings on what the government knows about UAP and does not know. Two, enact the provisions of the UAP Disclosure Act that establish a UAP Records Review Board to ensure independent oversight, transparency, and accountability in the government's handling of UAP information. And three, strengthen the UAP Disclosure Act and future reauthorizations with provisions that mandate a whole-of-government approach to addressing UAP. In closing, I will share my personal reasons for speaking out on this topic. First, as a former science agency leader, having led the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, I've always sought the truth in human knowledge and thought. Now that we know UAP are interacting with humanity, and these include unidentified submerged objects in the ocean, we should not turn a blind eye but instead boldly face this new reality and learn from it. Additionally, at a time when leaders in government leave much to be desired, I feel obligated to show moral leadership on this issue of UAP disclosure by validating the credibility of the courageous men and women who have come out as witnesses and whistleblowers to expose the truth. My speaking out has encouraged others to do the same, and it may, it my, it's my hope over time that a number of your constituents will want to know the truth and, uh, about UAP, and will increase, this number will increase to such an extent that the congressional action I've just recommended will become inevitable. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. I will now recognize Mr. Elizondo for his opening statement. Greetings, Chairwoman Mace, Chairman Grothman, Ranking Members Connolly and Garcia, and members of the committee. It is my honor and privilege to testify before you on the issue of unidentified anomalous phenomenon, formerly known as UFOs. On behalf of our brave men and women in uniform and across the intelligence community, as well as my fellow Americans who have awaited this day, thank you for your leadership on this important matter. Let me be clear, UAP are real. Advanced technologies not made by our government or any other government are monitoring sensitive military installations around the globe. Furthermore, the U.S. is in possession of UAP technologies, as are some of our adversaries. I believe we are in the midst of a multi-decade secretive arms race one funded by misallocated taxpayer dollars and hidden from our elected representatives and oversight bodies. For many years, I was entrusted with protecting some of our nation's most sensitive programs. In my last position, I managed a special access program on behalf of the White House and the National Security Council. As such, I appreciate the need to protect certain sensitive intelligence and military information. I consider my oath to protect secrets as sacred, and I will always put the safety of the American people first. With that said, I also understand the consequences of excessive secrecy and stovepiping. Nowhere was this more apparent than in the aftermath of 9-11, which many of us remember all too well. I believe that America's greatness depends on three elements. A, a watchful Congress, B, a responsive executive branch, and C, an informed public. Over the last decade and a half, I learned that certain UAP programs were and are operating without any of these elements. Although much of my government work on the UAP subject still remains classified, 
Excessive secrecy has led to grave misdeeds against loyal civil servants, military personnel, and the public, all to hide the fact that we are not alone in the cosmos. A small cadre within our own government involved in the UAP topic has created a culture of suppression and intimidation that I've personally been victim to, along with many of my former colleagues. This includes unwarranted criminal investigations, harassment, and efforts to destroy one's credibility. Most Americans would be shocked to learn that the Pentagon's very own public affairs office openly employs a professional psychological operations officer as the singular point of contact for any UAP-related inquiries from citizens and the media. This is unacceptable. Many of my former colleagues and I have provided classified testimony to both the Department of Defense and the Intelligence Community Inspector General, and many of us have subsequently been targeted by this cabal with threats to our careers, our security clearances, and even our lives. This is not hyperbole, but a genuine fact, and this is wrong. To fix these problems, I propose three principal actions. First, Congress and the President should create a single point of contact responsible for a whole-of-government approach to the UAP issue. Currently, the White House, CIA, NASA, the Pentagon, Department of Energy, and others play a role, but no one seems to be in charge, leading to unchecked power and corruption. Second, we need a national UAP strategy that will promote transparency and help restore the American public's trust at a time when the public's trust is at an all-time low. This strategy should include a whole-of-government approach, including the academic and scientific communities, the private sector, and our international partners and allies. Third, Congress should create a protected environment so whistleblowers desperate to do the right thing can come forward without fear. As it currently stands, these whistleblowers suffer because of stigma, a code of silence, and concerns about retaliation. These whistleblowers should be encouraged to come forward in ways that protect them against any forms of retaliation. Policies and procedures should ensure that protection, and for those who refuse to cooperate, it is up to the members of this committee and the other lawmakers to wield their subpoena power against hostile witnesses and prevent additional government funding to those UAP efforts that remain hidden from congressional oversight. In closing, we as Americans have never been afraid of a challenge. In fact, we thrive on them, whether it's eradicating polio or going to the moon. We don't run from a challenge. We take it head on. To the incoming administration and Congress, I say to you, we need immediate public transparency. And this hearing is an important step on that journey. If we approach the UAP topic in the same way as we have Amer as Americans have met other challenges, we can restore our faith in our government institutions. Together, we can usher in a new era of accountable government and scientific discovery. I believe that we as Americans can handle the truth. And I also believe the world deserves the truth. Thank you esteemed members of Congress for your time today. It is profoundly appreciated by many. Thank you. I ask unanimous consent for Representatives Ogles of Tennessee and Bobert of Colorado to be waived onto the subcommittee for today's joint subcommittee hearing for the purpose of asking questions without objection so ordered. I would now like to recognize Mr. Schellenberger for his introductory remarks. Chairwoman Mace, Chairman Grothman, Ranking Member Connolly, Ranking Member Garcia, members of the subcommittees, thank you for inviting my testimony. One of Congress's most important responsibilities is oversight of the executive branch in general and the military and intelligence community in particular. Unfortunately, there is a growing body of evidence that the U.S. government is not being transparent about what it knows about unidentified anomalous phenomena, and that elements within the military and the IC are in violation of their constitutional duty to notify Congress of their operations. President-elect Donald Trump and former President Barack Obama have both said that the government has information about UAPs that it has not released. Current, um, there are other explanations for UAPs than that, that they represent a new form of life or non-human life. Current dominant alternative theories, including those put forward by Arrow, are that UAPs are some kind of natural phenomena we don't yet understand, like ball lightning or plasma. They could also be part of some new U.S. or foreign government weapons program, such as drones, aircraft, balloons, CGI, hoaxes, or birds. Whatever UAPs are, Congress must be informed, as, as must the people of the United States. We have a right to know what UAPs are, no matter what they are. However, we now have existing and former U.S. government officials who have told Congress that Arrow and the Pentagon have broken the law by not revealing a significant body of information about UAPs, including military intelligence databases that have evidence of their existence as physical craft. 
One of those individuals is a current or former U.S. government official acting as a UAP whistleblower. This person has written a report. This is the report that says the executive branch has been managing UAP NHI issues without congressional knowledge, oversight, or authorization for some time, quite possibly decades. Furthermore, these individuals have revealed the name of an active and highly secretive DOD unacknowledged special access program, or USAP. The source of that document told public, me, that the USAP is a strategic intelligence program that is part of the U.S. military family of longstanding, highly sensitive programs dealing with various aspects of the UAP problem. The new UAP whistleblower claims that the U.S. military and IC database includes videos and images taken using infrared, forward-looking infrared, full-motion video, and still photography. The report that was just shared with Congress says Immaculate Constellation serves as a central or parent USAP that consolidates observations of UAPs by both tasked and untasked collection platforms. Immaculate Constellation includes high-quality imagery intelligence and measurement and signature intelligence of UAPs, the whistleblower's report adds. The sources of this intelligence are a blend of directed and incidental collection capacities, capabilities, positioned in low Earth orbit, the upper atmosphere, as well as military and civilian aviation altitudes and marine time environments. The report to Congress details in detail various UAPs, including spheres, orbs, disks, saucers, ovals, triangles, boomerang, arrowhead, and irregular organic. The report describes various incidents found in the human intelligence databases. One involved orbs surrounding and forcing an F-22 out of its patrol area. In another incident, the crew of a Navy aircraft carrier watched a small orange-red sphere rapidly descend from a high altitude of 100 to 200 yards directly above the flight deck of, a, of the CVN or aircraft carrier. And since my reporting on this Immaculate Constellation last month, another source came forward who told me that they saw a roughly 13-minute long, high-definition, full-color video of a white orb UAP coming out of the ocean approximately 20 miles off the coast of Kuwait. It was filmed from a helicopter. Then halfway through the video, the person said, the orb is joined by another orb that briefly comes into the frame from the left before rapidly moving again out of the frame. The person discovered the video on SIPR, the Secure Internet Protocol Router Network, which the DOD uses to transmit classified information. A leading UAP researcher who utilizes the Freedom of Information Act to find out what the government knows, John Greenwald, told me last year that the U.S. government had been increasingly denying his, respect, his request for UAP information. He has been doing FOIA requests for 27 years and has an archive of 3 million pages. The government has for decades denied any interest in UFOs, he told me, but the documents that he has assembled show that behind the scenes it was a completely different story. Contrary to the hopes of many advocates of transparency, the government has been restricting more information since the leak of three UAP videos in 2017. The DOD organization Arrow has been labeling many documents with a B7 exemption, which Greenwald says does not make any sense. They're stating that anything Arrow does is involved in law enforcement investigation, which allows Arrow to not release it. Greenwald says that the DOD has denied the existence of a UAP and ATIP-related records on multiple occasions, only to acknowledge them after an appeal was filed. He added that the Naval Air Systems Command in March 2022 stated they found no additional UAP videos. It seemed strange that they had three and only those three, but other requests had been filed by the Black Vault, that's John Greenwald's group, to seek out more places UAPs might be hiding. Then in September 2022, the Navy admitted that the UAP-related videos and photographs existed, but denied the request in full for their release, saying that the requested videos contain sensitive information that are classified and exempt from disclosure. The DOD will de deny things on a Monday and then admit to it on a Friday, said Greenwald. He said the government can and does release videos that protect secret methods of capturing it. They fall back on the sensitive platform excuse a lot, he said. However, the on-screen information can be blurred and scrubbed. The metadata can be removed. I'll show you this example here. This is a presentation from the UATP task force. This is completely absurd. It's nuts, this level of, of censorship, of redaction on a document. It shows the redaction of how many reports they've collected, for how many years. Two of the three potential explanations are blacked out. The Pentagon, the intelligence community is treating us like children. It's time for us to know the truth about this. I think that we can handle it. Thank you very much. Thank you. I would now like to recognize Mr. Gold for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman Mace, Chairman Grothman, Ranking Members Connolly and Garcia, Representative Moskowitz, and distinguished members of both subcommittees. 
I'm grateful to all of you, as well as your intrepid staff, for the opportunity to testify. I would like to begin by discussing courage. Courage is what it takes to tackle this topic. And courage in the face of adversity is what I see in front of me, beside me, and behind me. Per my introduction, I am currently the Chief Growth Officer at Redwire Space and have had several leadership positions at NASA. That being said, I want to be clear that I am speaking exclusively on my own behalf and not for Redwire, NASA, or any other organization. However, I am here today to speak out for science. Science requires data, which should be collected without bias or prejudice. Yet, whenever the topic of UAP arises, those who wish to explore the phenomena are often confronted with resistance and ridicule. For example, members of the NASA UAP independent study team, particularly those in academia, were mocked and even threatened for simply having the temerity to engage in the study of UAP. Our best tool for unlocking the mystery of UAP is science, but we cannot conduct a proper inquiry if the stigma is so overwhelming that just daring to be part of a NASA research team elicits such a vitriolic response. Therefore, one of the most important actions that can be taken relative to exposing the truth of UAP is to combat the stigma. And this is where I believe that NASA can be eminently helpful. The NASA brand is synonymous with hope, optimism, and credibility. If you were to take a walk down the National Mall, you would immediately see the NASA logo on T-shirts, hats, and bumper stickers. Few federal agencies enjoy this kind of popularity. I've never seen anyone wearing an Office of Personnel Management T-shirt, which is why NASA could play such an influential role. Specifically, NASA could, with relatively little cost and effort, uh, host symposia on UAP, or even just participate in existing panels examining the topic. NASA personnel stepping forward and participating in such discussions would make a powerful statement to the scientific community that UAP should be taken seriously and researched accordingly. In regard to research, NASA has vast archives, much of which may contain important UAP data. Again, for relatively little cost and effort, NASA could create an AI or ML algorithm that could search the agency's archives for anomalous phenomena. I suspect that such an effort would not only result in information that will help us to understand UAP, but could result in data that will assist in other areas of scientific inquiry, such as anomalous weather or meteorite activity. Beyond its existing archives, NASA could act as a clearinghouse for civilian and commercial UAP data. During my work on the UAP independent study team, it quickly became evident that there is no clear or well-publicized process for civilian pilots to report UAP sightings. The stigma associated with UAP hampers the number of pilots that would report such phenomena, but even for those who overcome the stigma, I believe the current FAA guidance is largely unknown and poorly understood. In order to effectively collect UAP data, the independent study team recommended the use of NASA's Aviation Safety Reporting System, or ASRS. This system, which is administered by NASA and funded by the FAA, provides a confidential means for the reporting of safety violations in a voluntary and non-punitive manner. Over 47 years, the ASRS has collected nearly 2 million reports. ASRS is the perfect tool to collect UAP data, which could then be collated by NASA and shared with the public at large. Leveraging ASRS could create a treasure trove of UAP data, potentially hundreds of thousands of reports, supporting this hearing's goal of exposing the truth. And I'm grateful to our two co-chairs and other members who have already incorporated this idea into proposed legislation. At this hearing, and as others have demonstrated, the UAP issue is justifiably dominated by national security and defense. However, I would urge the subcommittees to keep in mind the numerous ways that NASA and the FAA, as well as commercial activities in the air, in space, and in the water, can generate a massive amount of invaluable data on anomalous phenomena. I cannot help but be excited by the potential for such an endeavor since scientific discovery is driven by anomalies. It's the existence and study of anomalies that led to the theory of relativity, quantum mechanics, and nearly all of humanity's scientific breakthroughs. This is why the study of UAPs should be embraced since whatever is occurring, the chance to garner new knowledge should never be ignored. We must be thorough in collecting information, fearless in making conclusions, and open to following the data, no matter how mundane or extraordinary the results may be. I began this testimony by praising the Joint Subcommittee members for their courage. 
And I will end by echoing that sentiment. As the saying goes, the truth is out there. We just need to be bold enough and brave enough to face it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, I will now recognize myself for five minutes of questioning. I have a lot of questions, and I have a lot of witnesses. So I would just ask if it's yes or no to please just tell me yes or no. Um, if it requires more than that, um, be very succinct, because I would like to go down the line and a ask as many questions as possible. So for the Admiral this morning first, former DOD official Chris Mellon reached out to you about satellite imagery from 2017 that depicts a UAP. What were the dates in 2017 when this occurred? I can't share with you the details, ma'am, but I can do it in a closed setting, and I can also tell you the agency that wrote a report on it. Okay, so who has the imagery? I can tell you that in a closed setting. Uh, can you describe what was depicted in the satellite imagery? Just a description. It was a UAP, ma'am. That's it? No other description? The, 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 accurate, the term that the analysts used, they called it the button. It was a, it was a disc-shaped object. Okay, where was it? I can't tell you that, man. Okay. Um, all right. Okay, Mr. Alaz Alizondo, you state in your testimony that, quote, advanced technologies not by our government or any other government are monitoring sensitive military installations around the globe, end quote. If these technologies are not made by any government, who's making them? Private companies or are you implying they are crafted by a non-human intelligence? Well, ma'am, that's precisely why we're here. Uh, the problem is that, temporally speaking, over decades, not just the last 10 years, before, w to put this in perspective, when Are these private companies you're implying, or is this uh, non-human intelligence? It may be both. Uh, okay. When it comes to Blue Force technologies, are I would not be able to discuss Okay. That. Are you read into secret UAP crash retrieval programs? Um, we would have to have a conversation in a closed session, ma'am. I signed documentation three years ago that restricts my ability to discuss specifically crash retrievals. Um, I submitted for my book through the Dopser process, which took a year mm -hmm. for it to be reviewed. And what is in the book is what I was told I'm allowed to talk about. Uh, Has the government conducted secret UAP crash retrieval programs, yes or no? Yes. Okay. Were they designed to identify and reverse engineer alien craft, yes or no? Yes. Does the U.S. government have any reverse, uh, okay, we already asked that question about re retrieval programs. Um, do any U.S. contractors have the same? Um, I would prefer to address that in a closed session, ma'am. Okay. In your book, you mentioned government employees who've been injured by UAPs, placed on leave, and receiving government compensation for their injuries. Is that correct? That is correct. How can the government deny we have recovered craft if they're paying people because they've been injured by recovered craft? Ma'am, that's a great question. That's why I think we're here again, because I've seen the documentation by the U.S. government for several of these individuals who have sustained, sustained injuries as a result of a UAP incident. It's a crazy idea, right? The hypocrisy and the logic. Okay, Mr. Schellenberger, I'm going to say it again uh, to be very clear. Immaculate Constellation. Um, what's its mission and how are they funded? Its mission is to, as I stated, its mission is to, um, it's, a, it's an unacknowledged special access program. Its mission is to document UAPs. Okay, and do you, uh, for your story and your report, do you have more than one credible source? I do. Sourcing, okay. I do. And then uh, why do you believe your sources to be credible? How do you judge the veracity of the documentation you've been provided about this program? I checked the sources, and they are who they say they are. They are uh, current or former government officials. Mm -hmm. I should also, I wanted to also add that um, I did not specify that they were uh, Defense Department employees. I didn't specify the agency nor the gender. Would they have included non-government employees, people that aren't employed by the government? Uh, these are, I'm, ha I'm comfortable saying that these are uh, government or uh, previously government employees. Any of them currently employed by a private contractor or private contractors? I'd rather not say. Okay. Um, what's the key takeaway, uh, just a few seconds, uh, about the Immaculate Constellation document you provided us today? I think that what the American people need to know is that the U.S. military and intelligence community are sitting on a huge amount of visual and other information, still photos, video photos, other sensor uh, information, and they have for a very long time. And it's not those fuzzy photos and videos that we've been given. There's very clear... High images, res. High resolution. How many, how many visuals, graphics, videos, photos? I mean, I've been told hundreds, you know, maybe thousands. I mean, mm -hmm. I also wanted to say, because there was, some, there was some conversation around 
concern around uh, the, the revealing of these materials, revealing the source collections, but some of these are shot from helicopters using normal videos of oceans. I just think that's absurd that somehow you're going to be revealing some secret U.S. technology by revealing that you've, sh you've photographed orbs off the coast of Kuwait. Okay, thank you. I have eight seconds. Mr. Gold, did NASA, the NASA Independent Study Team get briefed on what you call OSAP very quickly? Uh, I flagged uh, the Advanced Aerospace Weapon System Application mm -hmm. Program to our chair uh, and our DFO. We did not get briefed, but I believe it is definitely worth looking into. That was probably the largest UAP review effort ever, and I think okay. produced a lot of interest data, including revealing Nimitz. I don't know if uh, my fellow witness, Lou, might want to. He did yeoman's work on it, might want to comment. Okay. All right. I'm going to uh, turn to Mr. Moss.